If you are moving to Minnesota from anywhere else in the world, even if it gets cold there, you are still definitely gonna wanna watch this video. Stick around. How's it going, y'all? My name is Jesse Lynch, and this YouTube channel is devoted to two things, teaching people about the ins and outs of buying, selling, investing in real estate, and showing off this amazing place that I live, the Twin Cities, and also giving helpful tips for people who are living there. If any of those things sound up your alley, do us both a favor and subscribe to this channel. Click the little bell to get notified, and you will not be sorry you did. I put out at least one video a week. I will say these virtual tours, they are trickier, they take longer to do, but I think they are maybe the most valuable video that I do to people moving from out of state. So that's why I keep doing them, even though they take longer to edit and so they take longer to release. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. Are they your favorite videos? Are there other types of videos that you prefer of mine? Or are there videos that I'm not doing that you wish I was doing? Cool. Okay, so let's dive in to this video, which is very specifically what to expect when you move to Minnesota during the winter. And like I said at the beginning, even if you are from somewhere that has a winter, just because you have a winter doesn't mean the winter there is the same as the winter here. There are just weird nuanced uh, quirks about the Twin Cities that are different for sure than a lot of other places that have winter. A big part of this video actually spawned from a conversation that I had with some people who moved here from Washington and I was helping them find a house. And they are the best people, so shout out to them. And I had realized shortly before that, that in my pros and cons video, I, you know, I talk about, I say the winter is one of the cons, right? The cold weather is one of the cons, but I don't really go into the depth of really what does that mean? Like what's the bummer about winter specifically? And don't get me wrong, I don't think winter's pure bummer. I think it's beautiful. I think the crisp air, is nice. It's maybe a little bit too long here. Hey, that's my cat, Chewy. I call her chicken. She's the best, <laughs> but sorry. So yeah, I don't really cover, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, the winters are, you know, not the most fun here. So what should you actually expect? So that's what this video is about. And first thing I wanna talk about is when does it get cold? I was talking to some folks from Orange County who were also amazing and they were coming here to visit for like a month before they moved over here and they were curious, if I come in October, is it gonna be winter yet? Is there gonna be snow? And the answer to that is no. It is definitely still fall during October. Every now and then it'll snow a little bit in October. In 92, there was a Halloween blizzard, but that's the last day of October, so that hardly counts. And we do have a beautiful fall season. If you're coming from the lights of Orange County, like they were, then potentially October is going to feel like your winter, so be prepared for that. But it definitely is not our winter, and it gets a lot colder than it is in October here. So in October, I would say you should expect on average overnight lows somewhere in the 40s and then highs in the 70s. Rarely does it get to 80 and probably more realistically in that 40 to 60 degree range, a little bit of rain, very little snow. And if it does snow, usually it doesn't stick around for super long. And then how long does it last? Mm, usually it's kind of uh, done by the end of March, but sometimes it sticks around way into April and sometimes it's melted in February and we hardly get any snow at all in March. But for sure, I would say November to February, expect there to be snow on the ground in some fashion. And the really cold months, December, January, and then even into some of February. Below zero weather days are totally normal here. That's Fahrenheit for those of you who are not from the US. And without fail, as it starts to be March and it gets up into like the 40s, you will begin to see people walking around in shorts and a t-shirt who are just so thrilled for warm weather and it's gonna be like in the 40s. So that's a rough outline of, I guess, what you could expect timeline wise of our winter. And you know, the coldest days are basically from November to February, and then it's just kind of cold in the margins there as well, but it's definitely still a little bit of fall and a little bit of spring, but you know, we get all four seasons, so that is a good thing. All right, say you moved here and it's already cold. There's some funny rules. There are certain things that we do here to deal with the cold that a lot of other places don't do, and I don't know if that's just because we are that much colder or it's just 
things that people decided were going to happen. Who knows? The first of which is in like the Pacific Northwest, the likes of Washington, Oregon, Boise, maybe Montana, you will see people using chains in the winter. Uh, they will chain their tires, you know, to like add traction and add grit. And we don't do that here. I've lived here my whole life and I couldn't tell you how to chain up a tire, to be totally honest. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. Which brings me to my other thing, which is something that we do here that a lot of other places don't do, which is that we salt our roads. Salt melts ice and melts snow and makes the roads uh, considerably more drivable than if we didn't use salt. But that comes at one pretty big expense, which is that it rusts our vehicles. So as a rule, the best way to combat the damage done by the salt is to wash your car pretty off. Which brings me to another point, which is that when it gets really cold and you wash your car, your doors might freeze shut, your little lock mechanisms might shut. So if you carry a purse or a bag or something, they have this little uh, like lock de-icer thing where you can sort of stick it into the keyhole and it, it's like a chemical or whatever and it, and it de-ices the lock. That's not a bad idea to have. But also just kind of know that it, when it gets really cold, either dry your car really, really well, specifically around the locks and the lock mechanism inside the door, or maybe just don't wash your car, which gosh, this brings me to another thing. It's funny, all this stuff I didn't have written down. A little thing that you will find is that on the nice days of our winter, when it gets warmer, maybe it gets like above 20 in December or in January, car washes almost always have really long lines. My favorite trick to that is to go at night, which yeah, I know it gets a little bit colder, but if it's still warm-ish at night, not that many people go get their car washed late at night, but I do, because I think it's easier. Okay, so back to the salt. Obviously the best way to deal with that is just by washing the salt off as often as possible. And then sort of another thing to consider that if you're gonna buy a used car, in Minnesota, it's not always the best place to buy a used car because the car has gone X amount of years in a salty environment and so it's more likely to rust and that kind of thing. Seriously, the first time I ever went to California when I was like uh, 21 or something like that, uh, I remember seeing some, some like brown Honda Civic from like the mid 80s and there was no rust on it and I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> How do they do that? They have they not driven that at all? But no, they, they drove it plenty. They don't salt their roads there, so their cars don't just rust, you know, like crazy. More modern cars are definitely better at fighting the rust, but the old, like purely metal vehicles have a rougher go at it. So you'll even see people who have classic cars who just, they do not drive them in the winter full stop. Okay, another thing that we do to basically deal with all of the cold weather and the snow and the ice is that they will sand the highways and they'll sand the roads. Sometimes it'll be a mixture, I think, of salt and sand, and they'll definitely do that in parking lots and in walkways and that kind of thing. And basically what that does, obviously the salt melts the snow and the ice, but the sand sort of adds grit, which you know lets your tires grip the road a little bit better. The good thing about sand, not really negative effects. They have to sweep the streets pretty thoroughly come the spring, but it doesn't damage your car or anything like that. A couple other things very specifically about driving in the winter. One is that when it snows really bad, if you happen to know that it's gonna snow a lot overnight and maybe you have a very strict job who really needs you to be into work at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., you're gonna to wanna to leave a lot earlier than you normally do, like maybe triple the amount of time of your normal commute. If it's really bad snow, seriously, triple. And sometimes that's not even enough. And if you maybe have a job where they aren't as strict and you have some plans in the evening and it's been snowing all day, expect rush hour again to take double or triple, seriously, the amount of time that it would normally take you even during normal rush hour. Right, so if say there's no rush hour, it takes you 15 minutes to get there, and during rush hour, it takes you half an hour to get there. During rush hour, during really bad snow, seriously, I might give it an hour and a half. It's kind of crazy. I guess if you're from LA, you're like, that's not bad, that's normal. <laughs> that's because their traffic sucks. Also, something to be aware of, bridges 
gets slippery. Bridges, if like an underpass where cars go under it or where, you know, water goes under it, you know, a bridge. Obviously, they're not insulated by the earth and geothermic energy from underneath. So because of that, the top of them stays colder and ultimately it will freeze a lot easier than the rest of the road. Some of the bridges in the Twin Cities are heated, I think. I think I'm not making that up. I'm pretty sure I know that to be a fact, but a lot of them aren't. And if you're driving in the winter and everything seems cool, roads don't seem to be slick at all, just still be careful on bridges. They are way more likely to be slippery and just be careful so you don't fly over the edge of a bridge or run into the guardrail or whatever. Don't say I didn't warn you. And the last thing is, it'll probably be pretty obvious, but stay back pretty far from snow plows. You can get a ticket if you're too close. Um, also, they can like just decide to start salting <laughs> and then you'll get a car full of salt. And also very often they will do these rows of snow plows where, you know, if it's a four lane highway, they'll have four or even five snow plows that are like going in like a consecutive fashion. And so, you know, this one, pushes snow that way, the next one pushes the, that snow and it's snow and, and so on. And that's a way that they clear the road. But sometimes if you're behind a snow plow on the highway, you like, well, on the one hand, you have the benefit of not having a super snowy road to be going on, but you might be stuck going 20, 25, 30 miles per hour down the highway because there's a huge line of snow trucks ahead of you. Okay, enough about driving. Uh, I feel kind of like a dad who's, you know, teaching their kid about how to drive. But the truth is that the driving and the roads are such a massive part of what makes winters here a challenge that I think it's a pretty important thing to talk about. Okay, if you watch my other video, uh, the pros and cons video, or my other things to know about Minnesota video, then you probably know some of this stuff, which is that I cannot recommend enough a car starter, like a remote car starter, especially if you're from somewhere that isn't cold and you're coming here, that will be a lifesaver. And I think you can get them for $300 and it will probably be the best $300 you spend. It just makes winter so much more tolerable when you go from your house or your job or whatever to your car and it's cold between the two, but when you get into your car, it's warm again, whereas if you don't and you run out to your car and you just leave, your car's gonna be cold for like 15 or 20 minutes on your ride home. So you just sit there cold and tense for you know a lot longer than you necessarily have to. A lot of people also will go and start their car to warm it up before they leave, but the car starter saves a lot of energy, a lot of hassle, and a lot of you forgetting to do that, you know, because it's so simple. Because it's so simple. One thing that you will also need is a scraper. If you're from the South and you have no idea what a scraper is, there's kind of two versions of the same thing. One is just a piece of plastic with like a hard edge and you, you know, you, you sort of scrape the ice on your windshield and that gets like specifically ice off. But a better one to have is one that has that part, but then also has a brush, like a little broom on it. That way you can scrape the ice and then brush it off or brush the snow off first and then scrape the ice. Okay, in a pinch, if you forget your scraper somewhere or whatever, a credit card can work or like a crappy little like store card, you might be able to scrape some ice off with something like that. But obviously if it's too thick, you're kind of out of luck. The best thing would be to do would be to just turn the defrost on super high and let it run for a while and let the car get warm and, and thaw the ice that way. Another huge thing that maybe I should have put this earlier on, but either this will affect you or it won't at all. It depends on you know where you end up living. If you end up living in like uptown or downtown or somewhere where you don't have a garage um, or you don't have specifically off street parking, then you will run into a thing called a snow emergency. A snow emergency is very specifically when the city or the municipality that you live in, specifically here, I know Minneapolis and St. Paul both have them. Um, they also might call it like a snow restriction. But what happens is when it snows a bunch, the city will declare we are in a snow emergency, which basically means that you can only park your car 
in certain places. Specifically, it'll say day one, you can only be on the odd side of the street on a non-snow emergency route. Usually the snow emergency route are like the main roads within the city. Uh, like in Uptown, it'll be the likes of Hennepin and Lindale and Franklin and Lake and you know maybe a few others. So that means that you can't park there basically overnight. I don't know exactly the rules, but side tip is to follow the city that you live in, follow their Twitter page or like their Facebook page, or just have a link to their website favorited where they announce the snow emergencies. Cause sometimes you'll be like, are we in a snow emergency right now? And you won't know. So it's helpful if you can have somewhere that you can quickly access that kind of thing. And for the record, the odd side of the street and the even side of the street, that's related to the addresses. Maybe that's obvious, but if you are looking at a house and it's 3208, then the side of the street that that house is on is the even side. And if you look across the street, there'd be like 3609 or something, right? And that would be the odd side of the street. So that being said, if you want to avoid having to deal with that, if specifically if you're just like coming here to rent, like if you're watching this video and you're not intending on buying a place, but you're going to rent. If you have a car and you don't want to mess with that, look for somewhere that has off street parking. At least if you can get a garage even better, and then you, you don't have to scrape your car off in the morning. If you have a heated garage, even better. That way your car is just warm and you don't have to warm it up before you head out. Another thing to note is that if you find that you're working in downtown Minneapolis, I think very specifically only downtown Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul has some as well, but there is a, a skyway system in Minneapolis, which you probably see it on other videos, but basically what it does is it links a bunch of the buildings in downtown, like many, many, many of the main, you know, the biggest buildings in downtown. It links those so that you can walk from building to building or even kind of across downtown while staying inside because you're in the Skyway system. If you're not familiar with it, it can be super confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it can be very helpful. Maybe you have, for work, you have a parking garage that's, you know, $100 cheaper, but it's two blocks away, but it's connected to the Skyway. Not that big of a deal. Also, if you are moving here from somewhere that is not quite as cold, then I really can't underplay enough how important like a good coat is. Also, good gloves, very helpful, a hat, helpful a scarf i find a scarf to be particularly helpful i don't know why it kind of keeps your your kind of your core warm obviously a scarf without a coat is kind of you know pointless but you can layer up you can put like a sweatshirt on or a hoodie and a coat and a scarf and then you'll be in a lot better shape than if you just have a coat on you think that's going to be enough i know it looks cooler maybe to not have all the accoutrement but i promise you <laughs> When it gets really cold, we have, we literally, we have days that are 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. It is not to be trifled with. Another thing, if you end up buying a house or renting a house and you have a sidewalk, make sure you are shoveling that sidewalk and the pathway to your house. And because you can get a ticket, the city will give you a ticket if you're not clearing that snow. And if you happen to live in a neighborhood where the male people walk from house to house, then be nice and maybe shovel them a path between the houses that isn't the sidewalk. Okay, that's nice. That's a very Minnesota nice thing to do, but it is nice and it's not that hard. So you should do it if you can. Okay, and last thing, and this is uh, something that I feel like I've never seen anywhere else. I'm sure it exists elsewhere in the country, but I've never noticed it anywhere else. Here in Minnesota, we get something called ice dams. Ice dams are fundamentally, they are a cause of a poorly insulated roof or basically a roof that just like isn't made to properly withstand the winters that we have here. So fundamentally, here's what happens is you get snow on the roof and the snow can sit there. And for the most part, that's not a big issue. It'll sit on a roof for a very long time without causing really any problems. Sometimes the weight can be bad, but you don't have to go up on the roof and shovel. They do make these enormous like <laughs> roof scraper things. But, and if you have a problem with, with these ice dams, then maybe you're gonna wanna do that. But so anyways, an ice dam, snow sits on the roof and then our weather is crazy and it will freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. And so it freezes and it melts a little bit and it freezes and it melts a little bit. And what happens is at the very bottom of the roof, usually by the gutter. And so some of the ice will begin to like, 
you know, it first it's laying flat and then it starts to build up and then it builds up and it builds up and then water comes here and what would normally just go off here, now it gets stuck here, okay? A dam, right? And why this is dangerous is because shingles are designed to overlap like this, where the top shingle lays over that and so when water goes down it, it continues to go down that way. An ice dam can cause water to go up under the shingle. But fundamentally, that is the, uh, the concern. And so water gets under that shingle, it goes through the plywood, and then it goes through the sheetrock and the insulation, and eventually you have water in your house or you have a damaged ceiling or something like that. So ice dams are bad. And the best way to combat an ice dam is with a properly designed roof with proper insulation and proper ventilation and that kind of thing. But there are these other things which are basically called ice dam heat tape or ice dam heat strips or something like that. And they're sort of like these like S-shaped things that are at the bottom of a roof. And if you come here, you might see them and be like, what is that? And to be quite frank, they're kind of ugly, but I guess not as ugly as water coming in through your roof. But what they do is they plug into an outlet somewhere and they just slowly, they heat up. They're not super hot. They shouldn't be burning your house down or anything like that, but they heat up just enough to melt that ice and then it gives that water a channel through which to flow and ultimately prevents further ice dams. Okay, that was a lot of stuff. I realized that. So I'm gonna end it here. And if you are from the Twin Cities and you're watching this and you're like, oh dude, you totally missed the thing about the thing, leave me a comment and leave a comment for other people to read because I'm curious, I'm sure I forgot stuff. If you're from out of state and you have questions about how these things work or whatever, leave a comment. And if you are thinking about moving here, do us both a favor, get a hold of me, call, text, email me, leave me a message on my website, DM me on Instagram, DM me on Facebook, write me a letter, whatever you gotta do, do it. And I very much look forward to helping you and working with you. And I've had just the most fun helping people who are moving here from out of state and it is a blast and i promise i will take the best care of you don't be a stranger hit me up say hello i look forward to meeting you i look forward to talking to you soon all right love ya bye bye